Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, tutorial for HoloLens and in particular for research mode. Um, so um, before getting there, so here's roughly what we'll talk about. Uh, I'll first very briefly introduce for those of you that are not familiar with HoloLens and what's, what are all the sensors inside HoloLens and what HoloLens is, uh, was built for. Um, I'll briefly introduce that and give you some hardware architecture there um, of HoloLens. Um, then uh, the main part of the tutorial will actually be to, uh, to discuss and introduce uh, the new research mode on HoloLens, which essentially um, makes all of the imaging sensors available to you as researchers, so you can switch the device to a mode. So normally it is not available because of privacy reasons and other reasons, all the sensors are of limits to applications, uh, except for the standard RGB camera. Uh, but if you switch your device in research mode, you'll have access to all of the imaging sensors, and so in terms of a you know, a computer vision device with an integrated device that computes a lot of things um, uh, on the device all the time, like uh, calculating its position in space, with computing uh, 3D reconstruction of the environment, etc. All of this is still running, but at the same time, you can get access yourself to those raw sensor streams and then run your favorite computer vision algorithms either on the platform, on the device, or also uh, you can stream them to a PC and do your processing there, for example. So that's what we we'll mostly talk about. We we'll show a few examples of that, and then at the end, uh, we'll also have uh, we'll, we'll show you uh, our new depth sensor, which uh, both uh, will be integrated in next generation of HoloLens, um, uh, but also will be uh, independently also uh, made available as a Kinect for Azure uh, sensor package. Um, so this is all to come, but it's already a preview of that depth sensing technology. Uh, that we show towards the end of, of the tutorial. And so all of this will we'll keep to uh, uh, the time slot will be uh, so that you can then afterwards go to the, uh, uh, to the whole presentation. So we'll be done before then. Okay, so um, here's a picture of, uh, let me see. Uh, here's a video. Uh, I don't know if there's sound. Okay, there's not much sound. Uh, anyway, so this is a, a short one minute video that. Um, let me actually stop the sound. Okay. okay, anyways. So so this shows you what the HoloLens is made for. It essentially provides a view. Uh, it can augment the world with virtual objects that can be inserted in the world. But the key is that HoloLens enables you to place those uh, locked with respect to the world. And so for being able to do that, we need to do tracking all the time. Uh, but then it enables to, do, to uh, have people collaborate and look, still be in the world, see other people, but also see those virtual elements. Uh, collaborate with them, discuss 3D objects in the world. Uh, designs here, uh, just some examples. You can work with the holograms, uh, play games. Uh, notice that here for those games, it's important that HoloLens itself is not only aware of where it's, how it's moving through the world, but actually also the 3D geometry of the world, so that these objects are actually placed in the world. Like here, um, why enterprise we have scenarios where um, you're, for example, working and looking at uh, cat models uh, before they are built, uh, but you can get the real impression by seeing them in 3D mode. So lots of applications with HoloLens, um, just for those of you that um, were not familiar with it, potentially. Um, so what's inside? So if you look here, the key thing, and also probably most of interest to, to most of you is this uh, sensor bar, uh, where um, you essentially have here uh, a standard RGB camera, uh, a webcam essentially. Uh, that's the one that was already always accessible in Hong Kong. Uh, but then, uh, more importantly to us today is, uh, on the one hand, the environment tracking cameras. So you see these four cameras here. Uh, if you actually look, the two central ones here are actually stereo rigged looking forward. This is mostly for facilitating tracking, because tracking can uh, essentially immediately have a scale initialized if you have a stereo system. Um, and then you have two additional cameras that provide a wider field of view, so that uh, with a head-mounted system, if you quickly look around, uh, that you still, let's say I reconstruct the features here, my map is built over here, I quickly look around, uh, I can still see those features in the peripheral uh, cameras. Uh, so essentially for robustness of tracking. And so, on. so those cameras are very sensitive, uh, they're working in rapidly low high conditions, uh, much better access to media. Uh, those are grayscale cameras. Uh, 640 for really meant for doing uh, computing well. Uh, they're global shutter cameras also. Um, and then uh, the other sensor is uh, depth camera. Uh, this depth camera uh, essentially is a time of flight camera, so you'll hear more about, about this later. 
Uh, this is the current generation. We'll hear more in particular about the next generation uh, camera. Uh, notice there's here two different types of illuminators. So there's those two and those two. Um, they are actually there for, uh, for because the camera has two modes. Both are mode to, to do hand tracking and look at uh, near the near range. And this has to, for if you want to click, for example, with the lens, you have to do that high frequency to actually high frame rate to detect things. Uh, but at the same time, we also want to capture the environment. Um, we need, for hand tracking, you need a wide field of view because your hands can be too much anywhere. Uh, for reconstructing the environment around you, you can be also more limited to a smaller field of view. Uh, and that essentially enables you to save energy. Uh, also, the frame rate for the long range is a much lower frame rate because also the environment is not expected to change as quickly as your hands when you click. Uh, so, if you look at whole lens, essentially everything in the design of whole lens is about saving energy. And in particular, saving energy, not even for the battery, it's saving energy for the thermal design because we have a device on your head that should be comfortable, but it shouldn't feel hot. Um, and uh, so you don't, and of course, you don't want fans also in your ears. So this is actually the biggest challenge uh, in the design of HoloLens. Um, so here are the different sensors. Um, these are the display. Actually, notice also here there's an IMU in here. Um, the, that's used for uh, visual and inertial tracking. Uh, this is a compute board. Uh, on this is essentially a full computer. Uh, so it has an SOC uh, system on chip, as in a mobile device. Um, but on top of that, has also uh, this HPU, uh, uh, essentially a holographic processing unit, is a Microsoft designed ASIC uh, that uh, really has a whole bunch of PSPs on board uh, to do most of the real time, always on computer vision uh, perception algorithms uh, that are running uh, in the background. That also means that applications, for example, your computer vision applications, can use most of the SOC for, uh, for doing processing, as none of that is used, uh, or almost none of that is used. Uh, for the core vision algorithms that are running that are always on uh, the embedded algorithms uh, in HoloLens. Of course, also spatial sound. Um, and then here's an exploded view of all the hardware, a quite complicated uh, system. Um, and here's then a more uh, system diagram. Um, where you can see that normally all of those sensors, except for the video and the light sensor, uh, but essentially all of those uh, sensors that are used for computing and are always on sensors, when this camera goes on, there's actually a privacy line that goes on the phone. Uh, but these sensors are all on the time. Uh, they go to the HPU, and only the results of this normally go then further uh, and get exposed to applications. Uh, uh, but that's, of course, what in research mode will, uh, will actually enable you to get access to these raw streams. Um, a little bit more on the HPU. Uh, this is the current HPU. Last year, actually, at CVPR, we announced the next generation HPU. Uh, and we showed some demonstrations of real-time hand tracking, uh, also leveraging our DNN core that's implemented on the next generation uh, HPU. Um, so what are the core functionality computer vision algorithms that run on HoloLens, essentially in the background all the time? So first thing is knowing where you are. So this is six degree free freedom visual, um, uh, visual inertial odometry and SLAM. Um, it also includes visual relocalization. Um, the, so that's using the four uh, cameras. Then at the same time, it's actually building a model of the environment. Uh, and so that's using uh, this depth camera in the long range model. Uh, and this is then used to be able to make hologram placement and so on, environment aware, also generate, you know, allow occlusions, and allow holograms to work in, in the environment and so on. Um, and then of course, there's also a, the sensing as, a, as a input modality. First thing is that we actually also use the uh, head pose as you move around know where the device is in the environment, that's actually also used as an input device. It's essentially the cursor that you move around by moving your head around. Uh, and then, of course, speech uh, is a strong modality, and then also gesture and hand tracking, uh, essentially being able to click uh, or move things around uh, in the environment. Um, OK, so uh, so here's essentially the standard way that HoloLens works. All of the raw sensors going to the HPU, and then the results moving uh, applications or being made available to applications. Um, and then this is now, it, if you put a device in research mode, you essentially get uh, raw access, get access to the uh, head tracking cameras. Uh, and you also, so not actually the raw, raw dead data, which is internal. Um, there's multiple exposures being taken uh, to recombine, uh, to, to, to 
then generate dead maps. And so here, there are raw dead maps that are being exposed. You can choose the mode in which they expose for the workflow. And at the same time, you actually also get an actively illuminated IR image, uh, which is a recombination of the raw data here, which both gives you depth and IR. Uh, so you actually have a spotlight, an IR spotlight in a multiple lens, and so that can be uh, actually also quite useful for, uh, for processing. Okay, so that was the quick intro on HoloLens. Um, so we'll continue with uh, Pavel uh, for showing you hands-on uh, uh, some of the things you can extract from HoloLens. I think we'll start actually with a demo uh, where... Uh, I can take a kill. Yeah. So if everything work, works well, I <laughs> uh, should be able to see through the device portal. be able to see where I'm moving the environment. Uh, yeah, it's alright. Networking here is interesting. We might have to fall back to the cable, actually. Let's uh, fall back to the cable. Yeah, it just worked. Our Wi-Fi is actually malfunctioning here. Okay, you know, uh, so this is the device portal. It's uh, uh, Windows uh, 10, uh, when put in developer mode, always runs a web server that exposes uh, some information that's device specific, and uh, some of this information on HoloLens is a uh, uh, essentially visualization of what HoloLens sees at the moment. Um, and I have made a tactical mistake of extending my desktop. I'm sorry. Okay, now I can see what I'm doing. Uh, so this is what HoloLens, uh, like I just pulled this out of the box here and uh, looked around. This is a visualization of the, uh, of the surface reconstruction. Let me actually put this in first person uh, mode. This is what uh, the device sees from Mark's perspective. That blob is probably me here. Uh, yeah, uh, hi. It, it updates at the low frequency, uh, as Mark mentioned, to conserve power. Uh, those updates are running up about once per second. Uh, so if we were to walk around, uh, sadly, uh, because of networking issues, we're limited by the cable for the uh, web connection. Uh, you could see how the device is tracking through the room and updating, uh, updating the mesh as it goes. I just clicked uh, to refresh uh, the mesh. Yes, yes, yes. The demo was a little bit better with the Wi-Fi. Uh, so what you see here is uh, the output of those environmental tracking cameras. This is how the device knows where Mark is looking. And the depth camera in the long-term mode, in the long-range mode, that is used for surface reconstruction. Um, so I think with that, uh, I'm going to start talking about the research mode. Very good. Unless people can hear me, I, I won't be one. Uh, this one is good. Thank you. I'm going to skip over the agenda, Mark, address this. So, uh, what I wanted to reiterate is that HoloLens is a PC, and you run your code on the device. Uh, spec wise, it's similar to the Surface 3. Uh, not the Pro, the Surface 3 uh, tablets. Uh, it comes with all Windows 10 APIs that you would expect to see on a uh, essentially mobile device. Uh, Mark mentioned perception APIs that tell you where the device is with respect to the world. Spatial mapping that describe the surface reconstruction. And uh, hand APIs. Other than that, we have all the generic uh, APIs for voice uh, and other input modalities. PV camera, microphones, graphics, it's all available for you. So uh, we actually have introduced research mode before. We have promised we're going to deliver. It actually uh, shipped uh, in, in uh, last month, uh, actually. 
So if you have a HoloLens and you accept the update to the uh, 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 April 2018 update of Windows 10, you should be able to get access to the four uh, cameras, the uh, depth sensor and the PV camera you already had before. So the research mode is something that you need to enable. Uh, as you have seen in the design, the hardware was designed for the data to flow just to the ASIC. We did our best uh, trying to make sure that you can get those images, but sometimes things interfere. So we're not feeling confident enough about this feature to be enabled by default. So what you need to do in device portal we just viewed, you just need to click this and reboot the device. Once that happens, you're going to be able to access those sensors. Uh, Yes, uh, the, uh, uh, yes, of course. And the device needs to be in developer mode for you to actually sideload applications because we will not allow applications making use of research mode to be published to the store just yet. There's lots of things that can go easily go wrong. So, uh, actually, uh, uh, we have exposed all the sensors to the standard Windows Media APIs, and we have a sample for that. Uh, this is my backup video. Let me actually back out of this and see if I can show you uh, this sample running live. Oh. I got tangled up. That's why we don't like cables, you know, we just tend to get tangled up in them. Uh, by the way, this application you can uh, uh, see running live and try out at our booth, on the Microsoft booth. Uh, so let me switch to the um, appropriate view here. <coughs> okay, so one thing you will notice, there is a little bit of the lag. This lag is on our web server side. Uh, what I see here as I move my hands, the effect is almost immediate. You're just seeing the delayed images because of the way the media is being streamed to, to the web browser. So uh, you can see on the bottom the four visible light cameras, the ones we use for uh, uh, tracking your head. You can clearly see that the middle pair is a stereo pair. You can see my uh, hand in both. And you can see that it's actually fairly uh, wide field of view. Okay. At the same time, what you see on the top, on the uh, top left, you see depth and reflectivity uh, in the short term mode. This is the mode we use for hand tracking. It works great on distances up to one meter. And uh, on the right, you see actually yourself. Uh, this mode works on distances up to four meters and updates a little bit less frequently. We use this view to reconstruct the scene. You can see that the field of view on the long throw is, as Mark observed before, uh, much smaller. Okay, so this demo worked. So I might be able to skip over the backup video. Uh, I'm still falling victim to my poor setup here. Okay, so uh, the Windows APIs, uh, there are many, and uh, using them can be quite complicated. This is why we have created an open source package that exposes the data in the simplest possible way uh, and uh, helps you with the basic stuff. Uh, uh, the code you need to write pretty much fits on one page. You just download one of the samples and start working on this. This is our uh, part of our sample of I'm going to show uh, at the end of this presentation. It shows how to obtain a synchronized uh, stereo pair. The cameras are not exposed at the same time. We, you need to pay attention to time, uh, timing. Uh, to make things simple and familiar, we have also made sure that OpenCV integration is easy. Uh, there, like again, one line of, of code gets you a CV mat uh, with uh, the images and uh, and that's pretty much it. We have two helper functions. One is specialized for the uh, visible light cameras. That's the one you see here. So nothing complicated here. 
Uh, we have spent a lot of time discussing how to expose the intrinsic uh, properties of the, of the camera. And uh, there are many ways, as uh, many people know, to approach this problem. We have decided to not expose the internal models we have. Instead, uh, you get access to functions that allow you to move from the image plane to the unit plane in front of the, uh, of the sensor. This way we avoid describing any particular models like uh, the one in OpenCV, for instance. Camera extrinsics, uh, uh, where the cameras are, we again expose through the essentially the same perception APIs that you use for anything else in HoloLens. Every frame comes with a, essentially tagged with a pose uh, to some uh, reference uh, uh, coordinate system. And you can easily get uh, the transform and start playing with Eigen and we're gonna see this running end to end uh, soon. So this is, again, basic HoloLens APIs here, nothing super fancy. So let me actually not go to that uh, backup video again. Let's see if the demo runs live. And I might actually, uh, it's quite possible that I'm about to demonstrate you why we are not ready to ship this in the store yet. try to move this back. So I hope that what you're seeing is nothing. Okay, that's very odd. <laughs> I will have to fall back to my backup video. Uh, it's actually tracking here. It's just not showing up on the device. Yeah, I don't know what's happening. I can see it here. Let me fall back to the backup video. Beauty of uh, live demonstrations, I guess. Um, uh, so basically, what I'm going to demo afterwards uh, running live here is a super simple uh, application that uses OpenCV's uh, contrib module for Aruco market tracking combined with all the APIs I've shown you before, to essentially put little cubes at the corners of the Aruco markers. Uh, I persist them for five seconds to demonstrate that HoloLens can track them, uh, even when they're not directly observable. That's what we had the head tracking cameras for. Uh, so before we go further, uh, all the samples and all the code up until here, again, uh, is on GitHub, github slash Microsoft slash HoloLens for CV. I'm gonna show the links later. And uh, uh, please uh, give it a try and uh, we hope you're gonna like it. So we have a few examples of views uh, from people who have tried research mode before it was fully released. Uh, so this is some work from our friends in uh, MSR Cambridge. I think audio is not working. So here they're using the, uh, uh, the head tracking cameras to essentially do uh, multi-person skeletal tracking with some sort of uh, form of recognition. And uh, what we have heard as testimonials uh, actually is that the, they really like the quality of the images. We really paid attention when designing those cameras. So this is a first person view from that application showing tags on people. Uh, Sudipta Sinha uh, used uh, research mode early, uh, actually he was one of our first users, to run some of his multi-view stereo experiments, and this is my previous office as reconstructed from a uh, walkabout in my office, a very nice reconstruction. This is a reconstruction based on the uh, grayscale uh, visible light cameras. You can almost see the paper, I think that George Klein's paper actually. So in this case, it's offline processing. Uh, we have tools actually on GitHub that easily allow you to download 
uh, recordings you can take online, and actually Johannes will speak about uh, his utilities he built around it to make it even uh, easier. Uh, addressing the uh, uh, fact that the front pair is stereo, so Dita also ran a quick experiment. Uh, this is us in our offices, uh, Harpeet uh, and me, and uh, in the middle is uh, some form of semi-global matching, uh, running actually at very high frame rates in, in case of Sodita's code. So you can see there's enough overlap to, to tell us from the background. And uh, with that in mind, I'll uh, hand it off to Johannes. You want to use yours? Okay. Do I have HDMI? Yeah. Can I remove this part? Yeah. Oh, I can. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. So I had some, I had the chance to get some early access to, um, one second please, sorry. Get some early access to the research mode API last fall. And um, I built a little demo application um, around the research mode API that will hopefully be helpful for you to uh, get started with the um, whole API. And the overall motivation is the HoloLens has like all these great sensors and is only using essentially the um, active depth sensor for the 3D reconstruction part. And what I did is I built an application around the research mode API to do um, 3D reconstruction from the four grayscale cameras and the um, color camera. And for the 3D reconstruction part, we're using ColMap, which is this end-to-end image-based 3D reconstruction pipeline that is also open source. So you can just download some of the pre-compiled binaries for Windows um, to your computer and use the little script that is also going to be contained or is already in the repository um, to manage and run this whole pipeline um, from scratch. So the idea is you put on your HoloLens, you start this uh, recorder app that is also in the HoloLens for CV uh, repository. You start the recording by doing one tap, you walk around, capture the environment. You can essentially, you already cover everything that you see in the front and you tap again to stop the recording um, and then connect your HoloLens to your computer. And well, these are the different steps that I just described. You connect the HoloLens to your computer and run this little Python script that uh, you can see here um, that will automatically connect to the Windows device portal so you don't have to copy the data manually from uh, some hidden application folder uh, on the device, but it will automatically um, list you the recordings that you have on the device. You have around 60 gigabytes, I think, which will give you plenty of uh, space to walk around for maybe an hour or something to record a huge data set. And what you can do is you list your recordings on the device. Um, you can record specific, uh, download specific recordings to your computer, and then um, you will see here you have a list of recordings on your computer then, and can just, in, in this folder here on your computer, you will have all the depth sensors here, um, so all the sensor streams um, recorded into some archive files, which are standard tar archive files, you can just extract them yourself manually, or 
uh, use the script again to extract them into some separate folder again. And what you see here is for each sensor, you have three different files. One um, records the sensor poses, six degree of freedom camera poses for every frame of the sensor at every given time. And um, the raw images and undistortion maps that you can use to undistort the images. And then you can just say, I want to reconstruct recording zero, and then it just starts call map um, to do the offline reconstruction. And this is an optional step. You can also just use the script to download recordings from the HoloLens to your device if you're not interested into the um, reconstruction step. And one additional thing that might be useful for some of the people is it automatically also synchronizes your camera frames in the script. So if you want to have a look at how that works, the, just explore the code a little bit there. And yeah. So just as an example, I actually did an internship last winter in, at Microsoft Research. So I just walked around the uh, MSR building, just captured some uh, random sequence in the building. This is what you essentially get from the HoloLens, which is just the, all the camera poses that are recorded. And then you can run call map to get a sparse reconstruction of the scene and do offline loop closure to get a better uh, estimate of the camera poses. And then you can run the dense reconstruction part here um, of call map only using the grayscale cameras, no depth cameras integrated. Um, yeah, and you can see as opposed to just using the, the um, active depth sensor, you can actually reconstruct quite far away objects using the uh, multi-view stereo technique. Yeah, that's everything from my side and I think I will hand it over to Pavel again. Um, again, the script for everything is in the repository already and should be documented. Thank you, Johannes, again. Uh, Johannes helped us a lot, uh, find lots of good bugs. We hopefully subsequently fix all of them. Uh, let me see if I can get back to the last slide, uh, the uh, URLs. Five. Okay, and I promise uh, before you go, uh, those are the two most important URLs if you want to get started using uh, research mode. The first one points you to the GitHub repository with uh, our samples, our tools for streaming, recording, uh, running processing on your PC uh, over a network connection uh, whenever it decides to work, uh, running uh, processing through Python, uh, probably a couple other things. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing contributions to this similar to Johannes' uh, amazing scripts to actually manage the recordings. Uh, you can easily watch, set a watch for updates on GitHub uh, if you're interested in uh, developments. And uh, that's pretty much it. So I would like to open for uh, questions uh, before I hand off to my colleagues. Yes, sir. Great, great scale cameras. Yes. So they're global shutter, right? Yes, that's Kimo correct. Come again, sorry? This gray scale mm -hmm. cameras. <coughs> they're global shutter, right? Yes. Are they fisheye or just pinball cameras? I think uh, they're not fisheye. Uh, they're fairly low distortion. This, this yes. gray scale cameras, are they fisheye or pinball? No, they're pinball. They're pinball. Yeah. Yeah. Fixed focal length, of course, right? Yes, I'm not sure what the uh, it's, it's, uh, I mean, together they have a very wide 
So the device maintains it, its calibration or so, but uh, here it will essentially provide one calibration. So the device kind of maintains its calibration yeah. over time. Thank you very much. Thank I think you. we'll actually continue with uh, the demonstration of that okay. sensor and then Fair enough. questions after. <coughs> Okay, good afternoon everyone. I'm Michael Plyer. I'm working in the Depth Camera team for HoloLens at Microsoft. And I will spend three minutes talking about Depth Camera technologies and Kinect for Azure in particular. And then Andrew Duane is going to give you a live demonstration. So I assume most of you are familiar with uh, passive stereo. You have left and right camera. You perform stereo matching and that gives you a depth map. The problem is that doesn't work very well if there's only a low amount of texture. So this motivates active systems such as um, structured light or active stereo. And the trick is to have um, a projector that casts texture onto the scene. So you will know that um, structured light is probably the most uh, prominent representative is Kinect uh, 360. But Microsoft has switched uh, to time of flight recently. So for HoloLens version one, we have shipped pulse-based time of flight, but we have switched over to phase-based time of flight. <coughs> the reason for this is we have seen better results. And here is the principle of phase-based time of flight. So we have an illuminator that is pulsed at a certain frequency and that generates this sine wave. The sine wave hits the object and gets reflected to the camera. And now we compare the reflected signal against the emitted signal. In particular, we are interested in the phase delay here because that is a proxy for depth. We cannot directly observe the phase delay, but using a differential pixel, we can observe the correlation between reflected and reference signal. So you might know that this technology was used uh, in Xbox One, and Kinect for Azure is an improved version of that sensor. Here are a few specs. We have not completely settled on it. You're going to have different modes. There is going to be a wild field of view mode, and there's also going to be a long distance mode. We support resolutions up to one megapixel. And since it's also the sensor used in the next generation of HoloLens, it has really low power consumption. And Andrew? Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Duan. I'm also from HoloLens team. So uh, in the next few minutes, I will show you a live demo uh, with uh, this prototype of this depth sensing technology that's going to be used in Kinect for Azure and also next generation HoloLens. Uh, remember, uh, this is not the final product. So the housing is not the final. I don't even know what the final form that look, looks like. And uh, I will show you two example modes that will showcase what the depth map looks like. So let me connect it. Maybe I should do. Oh, 
Great. So now basically you see uh, this is a near mode that you can see is actually running real time for a very clean and complete depth map. You also see the IR feed. And now basically you can see if I put my hands really low or pretty, pretty close to some other angle, you can still see it. So this is actually a pretty wide field of view. This is a prototype mode, so the resolution is much lower than the megabyte resolution, but you already see some very good results here. And now if I switch to a point cloud, which you'll probably see more details, Okay, so if you see my clothes, the wrinkles on it, and I'm smiling, <laughs> and maybe some small object. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Michael Blake. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, there are some cable beside it. So um, now, basically, I will switch to the long throw mode which is a far range. And now you can see yourself. And I, I think it's currently reaching to, I don't know, maybe seven or eight row. Yeah, there's also the point cloud. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that's pretty much it. We will set up this, we already, already did, we set up the same demo in the Microsoft booth in the exhibition hall. So feel free to drop by and uh, thank you. So if your lab has a Connect2, a HoloLens, and an Intel RealSense, and all you need is just to capture RGBD images, which would you recommend? For RGBD, I would uh, go with Connect1, uh, Connect I guess. Oh, Connect1? Yeah. Oh, Connect2, oh, no, I, mean, I guess Connect2. Connect, I guess it's version not glass or else, obviously. Yes, 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 yes. But yes. as soon as Connect2 comes out, that's the one you want to use. Okay. If you want a mobile phone factor and easily kind of go around and capture a string that's all, then you probably want to do it. I tried doing some scene understanding work with Kinect and I bought, I went to Home Depot, I bought a very, very long power cable for that. So if you want to move outside of your office, uh, HoloLens becomes uh, an interesting option. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So that means the Kinect Pro Azure will also be packaged with an RGB camera? Uh, I yes, don't I think we are not uh, supposed to say exactly what, but yes, you can you know, imagine that it's at least uh, like a Kinect. Everything already done. <laughs> <laughs> was it filtered to the data that we saw now, or did it draw from the camera? This is already adding filters. Yeah, it's part of the raw detect algorithm. There is some filtering happening. Okay. You can see from the details that it's not heavy filtering. Right? Y yes, it is. Yes. With and without developer mode, you can access the. Uh, I think it's. Uh, uh, the Windows oh. API like yeah. Galaxy Extrinsic and doing the transformation. Uh, 
for the tag recognition demo you did all of were you using any of the features from the research mode, or was that just the No, I just called into Aruko's uh, detect markers. Okay. That's what so I did. Yeah, it's probably equivalent, yeah. Okay. The source code is uh, on GitHub, if you want to take a look. But, uh, so we don't have that, but you can essentially do the same from the uh, stereo head forward, and then you get much, you know, you get more accurate depth in particular. So before we Yes, yes, we, uh, we normalize the time sums, you get uh, essentially the system time, like the query performance counter time for all of them. They're very precise. And so you saw that um, Johannes did to essentially check that out and make sure so the images are initial, they're taken synchronously, uh, the, the, head, the head tracking cameras are meant. And so you would make sure that the right frames are put together in a, in a four frame. No, this is this is deep learning stuff and so on, but it, this was running uh, off device on a PC. So this was streamed live from the HoloLens using streamers streamed live to a PC and the PC was processing and sending it away. Yes, again uh, surface three. Uh, <laughs> not very fast, yes. We have samples for that, just over Wi-Fi. Or actually, in this cable, I had to fall back. Uh, in this case, I had to fall back to the cable, USB cable. But, but you can do it over Wi-Fi yeah. uh, in a less, uh, less clumsy way, yes. Is it possible to use multiple, the, the multiple new devices at the same time? Because it's, it's based on TOF, as opposed uh, to be some interference. Yes, I, I, I don't know what, what I guess. There, there will be the possibility and they will be synchronized to avoid interference. Well, but, but I think in general, I don't know what the current Holland is doing, but I think it's a very low duty cycle. And so by chance, you, like there's not that much chance, like if you just randomly do it without synchronizing, even then there is a low likelihood that you get a lot of Yeah, because the exposure times uh, of the time of flight camera are extremely small, so the likelihood for having overlapping exposures is really small. But there will be synchronization mechanism with the package of that. That's, that's what yeah. the pressure that's what we, Yeah. So, no, well, that's, SLAM is essentially, it's, uh, you know, it's essentially also integrated in the IU signals. And so we provide both, I think, at 240 hertz. Uh, images actually get generated at 240 hertz because we get 240. 240. 240. Now the... Uh, of IU or actual video set? Well, the IU runs even faster, but the images are 30 frames per second. Those get combined into yeah, 240, 240 poses of the uh, because actually the image generation on lens, on current generation on lens, this frame is color sequential. And so we do 60 hertz times four colors, uh, or two times or whatever. Like it's essentially, it's doing 240 hertz. Uh, it needs both of that 240 hertz to operate. So image acquisition is going at 240 or? No, image acquisition is 30. 30, that's what I have. Mm -hmm. This is. Okay, no more takers. I do invite you to visit our booth if you wanna see the demos and actually we can show a few demos here as well. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you.